So please come on and sit. Oh. Test. Okay. All right. So welcome to session nine, which is dedicated to side channel analysis. The first uh, talk of this uh, session is a systematic approach to side channel analysis of ECC implementations with worst case horizontal attacks. This is a joint work by Romain Poussier, Yuan Yangzhu, and Francois Xavier Standard. And the speaker is Romain Poussier. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm Roland Poussier and I will talk about horizontal side channel attack on elliptic curves and more specifically about work case horizontal attack. Quick look on the outline. I will first give the context and the motivation for this work. Then I will present our framework for the horizontal DPA and then I will go into the practical experiment. I will present the setup. I will show how we do the point of interest selection and I will present the result on our two targets. And I will finish by the conclusion and the future works. All right, so um, security of protocols based on elliptic curve are based on the discrete log problem, which means that we have to compute a scalar multiplication between the um, point P and a secret value K. And on the top of that, we assume that we have a side channel adversary, which is able to get, for example, the power consumption or the electromagnetic radiation of the computation of the scalar multiplication. What we can do with that? Well many things. We have many f different attacks from the DPA to the horizontal DPA and so on, and different tools do them. So the question is, um, if I have some time, fixed time, to do some security evaluation of an implementation, what should I use? Um, our approach would be to try to approach the worst case security in general. And why do we want to do that? Well, because it's a good way to avoid overestimating the security. And how can we do it? By using most of the side channel information which is available in the side channel traces. Quick look of the state of the art, not exhaustively. First, on the top, we have the very old DPA, which is an attack that needs several traces from the same um, scalar. The scalar needs to be known for the attack. So we class it in a um, strong attacker's assumption. And this attack only uses a very small part of the information in the traces. Then we have um, different attacks that are all, can all use only a single trace to be successful. First we have template attack, which requires a knowledge of the points in advance to do the profiling. This is a uh, strong attacker assumption attack. But this attack can use most or um, arbitrary amount of information in the side channel traces, but only recovers the first few bits. <laughs> so in order, in, in order to overcome this problem, we have the online template attack, which is basically um, recursive application of the template attack to recover the full key. It also requires a point known in advance and um, it requires very strong attacker's assumption since you need to reprofile on the fly during the online phase. But as for template attack, it can use an arbitrary amount of information in the side channel trace. Then we have the horizontal DPA, which will be the focus of this work, which is also a single trace attack. It needs to know the point as well, but not in advance. So it's still strong assumption and can still use most of um, an arbitrary amount of information. And finally, we have collision and bit manipulation attack, which are, can also work as single trace attack. They do not need to know the point, so they're weak attacker assumption, but they use a very small amount of the information. And this work will focus on HDPA because it's quite a fine trade-off between the small amount of information used by the last two attack and the very strong assumption of the online template attack. And with this, in this respect, our contribution are the following. First of all, applying an horizontal DPA is not that trivial. So we aim at describing how to do it in a systematic way by explaining every step. And we try to do a close to worst case security by leakage characterization. And also, there is no much practical experiment in the literature on HDPA. So we also present an A to Z application of HDPA on two targets, which are Cortex-M4 and Cortex-A8, with different level of difficulties. 
and a small teaser so you don't leave before the end of this talk. Um, at the end, I will present some, which in, in my opinion, very promising work that I would like to do in the future based on this work. So I talk about it at the end. All right, now I'll present our framework for the HDPA. First of all, how we, as we target scalar multiplication, we need a scalar multiplication algorithm. In this work, we consider the Montgomery ladder implemented in this way, which is a fully regular scalar multiplication. And uh, we consider also the small trick shown by the red uh, line, well, the red uh, small dot is writing. And just for the recur, up to my knowledge, I think there is only one collision attack that works on uh, this particular scalar multiplication algorithm implemented this way, which was presented two years ago in CTRSA. Let's zoom a little bit into the scalar multiplication algorithm. On the top, we, have the, we can see the scalar multiplication algorithm as a man, serial manipulation of the scalar bits. Each time we manipulate a bit, we have um, two elliptic curves operation. Each time we have an uh, elliptic curve operation, we have some field operation, which are, here I just show field multiplication, which have addition, subtraction, and so on. And for each field operation, we have to uh, do some register operation on the architecture's level. And in this work, we consider a constant time of a regular scalar multiplication algorithm, which is the full algorithm can be seen as a fixed and predictable sequence of register operation. So from now on, we see the full scalar multiplication as just a sequence of register operation. And for each of these registers, we have an associated site and leakages. And we assume that we have n registers per scalar bit. All right, now I will briefly give how an horizontal DPA works. So this is not new. First, you select several. I work how it. I show how it works for the first scalar bit. We select several internal registers that depend on the point and the first scalar bit. We try to modelize a function that show how this uh, register leak in practice through side channel. We call this step information extraction. We then acquire one measurement, one attack measurement. We prepare two sets. In the first set, it's the guess value that all these registers will take uh, if the scalar bit is equal to zero, and the second one if the scalar bit is equal to one. Then we compare, we are apply the leakage function we estimated to these uh, guess values, and we compare it to the actual leakages through distinguisher D. We call this part information combination, and then we select the keys that maximize the value of the distinguisher. So we identify two steps, and now I show briefly how we do them in our experiments. For the first step, so in the previous paper, it was um, horizontal correlation that was used. And what we want to do here is to characterize the leakage function. So for each resistor, we have a leakage, and we try to modelize it as shown by the value m here. We do the classical assumption that is uh, the combination of a deterministic part, which is L, and the random Gaussian noise, which is R. How can we do it? Well, we have classical template. Thing is, if we assume that we have registers of size S, for example, 32 bits, this will require roughly more than 2 to the 32 traces and um, same amount of computation, which is not really feasible if we have 32-bit architecture. So what we do is use linear regression only with a linear basis. So basically, we can use only O of S uh, computation and traces to do the profiling. Obviously, there, if there is uh, non-linear leakages, this will, of, of course, be less accurate than template, though. A few words on linear regression. So first of all, we have to estimate the deterministic part. So we acquire several traces with known point and key, which take the point in time that correspond to um, the given register we want to estimate. We, we compute the internal values depending on P and K. And we do some operation, which give us an estimation of the deterministic part of the leakage function. I don't dig into it. Then we have to estimate the noise. We take a second set of traces to over um, to avoid um, uh, over-characterizing it, overfitting. sorry. We do the same. Actually, this step is exactly the same as in template attacks. You estimate the variance of um, your decade function. So now, that's how we estimate the character of the decade function. Now we have to combine it, and we have a parameter. So this is a bit big, but let's assume we want to attack these color bits at a time. So we have some kind of probability tree because all the value, internal values depend on the value of the previous bits. 
let's assume that we have d equal to 3 and we want to compute the likelihood that the scalar is equal to 101. On the right, on the top, we have the actual leakage, the actual register with some leakages, and on the top we have a simulator which actually simulates the full scalar multiplication and the full values of all these registers for these three key bits if the value of the scalar is 101. And then since we obtain probabilities from the information extraction phase, combining the information is basically just multiplying the probabilities. All right, so now we assume that uh, there is more detail in the paper. I don't have time to show a lot about the horizontal DPA. I hope it's well understood, though. I present our experiments. First, the setup. We have two targets. First one is Cortex-M4 which one has 100 megahertz as constant time extraction mostly and 32 bit register is quite of an easy target. And we have the Cortex-A8 which run at one gigahertz and have a new Ubuntu running in the background which so there is a lot of disruption in the signal, well, at least more disruption. We use the consta uh, custom constant time assembly implementation of the NIST curve P256 and for the field multiplication we just use the classical school book multiplication, we didn't use any Karatsuba. But it's not really important because this framework is completely independent of the curve or the implementation as long as it's a regular implementation. <coughs> so, um, in total, per scalar bit, we'll have 1,600 registers that we target. So we only select them. There is way more, we could have used way, way more information, but this was sufficient for experiments. I want to stress the fact that even for optimized implementation, for example, um, P25519, with uh, Karatsuba and um, optimized implementation, you will have at least this amount of target resistors. For the trace acquisition for the Cortex M4, we use power traces, sample at 200 mega sample per second, and we record the first 123 scalar bits, and we have traces that were long as 40 million samples per trace. And for the and um, okay, so, and we only look at the first order success rate. That is, we look at if we are able to recover all these 123 bits or not. For the A8, we take EM measurement, sample at uh, 10 giga sample per second. We only use the first four scalar bits, we were two million samples per trace, and we do some pre-processing such as trace alignment, which will not be shown in this presentation for time reason, but there is some more information how we do it on the paper. And we'll consider that we'll, attacking, we'll be attacking ECDSA and we'll do a lattice attack on it that we'll show later. For the point of interest selection, basically we have two ways to do it. First one is a classical CPN, and the second one is a partial SNR. So I don't dig again into the details, but um, so we take the full trace, and for each time sample, okay, for a specific register, we take the full trace, and for each time sample, we try to find a time that maximizes some metric, which is uh, the CPA or the partial SNR. For a CPA, basically you just take the values of the registers and you compute the correlation with your time sample. For the partial uh, signal to noise ratio, it's basically the normal signal to noise ratio, but uh, you truncate the values of 32 bits into, sorry, B bits only. And why do we do that? Because there's two reasons. If we wanted to compute the normal SNR on 32 bits, it would be quite not really feasible because we would need more than two to the 32 traces. And second of all, um, if you do a full based uh, signal to ratio, we have some bijection issue. For example, if you take the example of the AES, if you compute the SNR of the plain text X or the key, you will have several spikes in your uh, traces. You have a spike for the XOR, a spike for the S-box, and a spike for the mix colon. But here we want to know the precise location of this register operation. And if you truncate this SNR on the AES on four bit instead of eight, you will have, you can identify exactly the position of your operation. So these two methods can work. Look, if you use correlation, what's good is that you use all the 32-bit information of your registers, but you need the leakage model, such so as the amine weight. But if you use partial SNR, you don't need a leakage model, but you use not the full information of the register. So this is quite up to you. But problem is we have huge traces, 40 million samples, and we have um, 1,600 times 133 point of interest to find. So if we want to use, for example, correlation for each register, looking at the full traces, this will just take months. So as we have a regular implementation, we know that we have a sequential uh, operation of register. We do a Windows mode, that is, first we, we select the Windows, the way to select it 
is de more detailed on the paper. We've, uh, we compute the correlation of the first register only on this window. There is a nice way to do it on the CPA, which is with the p-value to select if we find something or not. For the partial listener, you have to use a heuristic method. Then hopefully we find the location of this register in the trace, then we move the window, and we continue for a second register, and so on. All right, now we assume that we have characterized all the register and find, found all the point of interest. So now I show the result on the M4. So we attack 123 bits, and we look at if we recover the trace or not. And this is the result. Um, so we have two parameters. The first one is the number n of point of interest we take per scalar bit. And the second one is the number of uh, scalar bit we attack at the same time, which is the value d. And what we can see is in uh, our implementation by using 100, uh, sorry, 1,600 point of interest and four scalar bit attacked at the time, we achieved almost a success rate of one, which is, well, what's quite expected if you have uh, not that much noise on this target. If you do an HDPA, there is no much chance for the target to resist the attack. So second experiment is the result on the A8. So we only target the first four bits of the um, scalar, and we do a lattice attack. A few words on the lattice attacks. I don't recall ECDSA, but what you need to know is that when you do an ECDSA signature, first you will have to compute a nonce, an I, which will be used for a scalar multiplication, the point P. And this scalar is linked to the value of the secret key. And uh, there is the reduction. Uh, um, you can compute the key from several known nonce using short problem and using so LLL and everything. So basically, to the attack it, you run S signatures. For each signature, you have S, uh, you have a nonce and I. And we assume that through, for example, side channel, you're able to recover for each nonce the first B bits of this nonce. And then from this, you can recover the key, and the, val the numbers are shown by the graph. On the x-axis, you have the number B of, nonces, uh, of bits that are known per nonces. And on the y-axis, you have the associated number of signatures. In our case, so of course, the more, the more number of bits you know per nonce, the less signatures you need. In our case, we only attack four bits, which is on the leftmost value of the graph, which means that we need to attack um, 140, we need to use 140 valid signatures, nonces. In our experiment, we used uh, 2,200 attack uh, traces, so 2,200 2, signatures. For each of them, we tried to attack the first four bits. And we need to recover these four bits for each signature at least 140 times correctly. Problem is, the attack do not always work. Sometimes we recover the wrong bit. But for the attack, lattice attack to work, we need to have a 100% success rate for all the nonces. But the good thing is, as we use probabilities, we can use bias from the combination I've shown earlier to compute the actual probability of the each color bit. So what we do for each attack trace, we attack four bits, so we compute the, the um, probabilities of each of the 16 uh, scalars. We select the highest probabilities, and we look at, we set a threshold T, and if the highest probability is below this threshold T, we say, okay, this is not good enough, I discard these attack traces. And here are the results. On the left, you have the value of the threshold, then you have the associated success rate on recovering the four bits of the nonce. Then you have the associated success rate on recovering the key, which is basically the success rate of recovering the nonce to the 140, because we need 140 signatures with no errors. Then, depending on the threshold, you have the number of discarded traces and the number of remaining traces. First, if we don't set a threshold, obviously we keep all the traces, but we have a success rate only of 0 0.8 for the recovering the nonce, which is quite high, but when you put it to the 140, we get a very low success rate of recovering the key of 4 times 10 to the minus 13, which is obviously very low. But what we can see is as we increase the value of the threshold, we increase the success rate of recovering the nonce and also the success rate of recovering the key. And at some point, when we use a very high threshold, 
we get a success rate of 1, which is quite nice. And we still have uh, 242 traces, which is over 140, so it works. We're happy about that. All right. For a conclusion on the left, um, in this paper, our goal was to give a very detailed and um, quite sound way to do an HDPA through three steps. First one consists in having the abstract view of the ECSM through the registers sequential manipulation. Then we show how to do uh, information extraction to do leakage characterization and get probabilities and how to combine these probabilities. We applied it in practice in two targets and give a detailed explanation on how to do it from A to Z. And the conclusion, which is quite known actually, is if you want to resist a GPA, you need a lot of noise. But you're going to tell me, well, why should we care about it? Because the point is always randomized anyway through, for example, random projective coordinates. Well, that's true. But the thing is, if you exactly use the same framework and you replace the step C, which is information combination, by your use of a belief propagation algorithm. So you create a graph which will be connecting each register between each other, and you move the information toward the beginning of the algorithm, which is the randomized point, and you get information of the, on the random point which is used. So basically, I think you should be able to recover the point P that has been used and randomized. So hopefully, I think that will work, and I hope. Then, and once you've recovered the randomized point, you just apply the same framework and you hopefully recover the key for the attacker. And a few words, this could not be done using template or online template, which is why I also consider an horizontal DPA because this is, the exact, this, one, this is exactly what you need to do to use belief propagation algorithm. And this cannot be done as well with the correlation, which was formerly used by the paper which we're doing HDPA because you need to have probabilities for each point and not a single correlation value horizontal. And for more information on the, this Saska on a asymmetric crypto, there is a next talk which will be about Saska on a lattice-based crypto. Thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, just, just uh, a question about the the, um, the reason why it cannot, can your, your approach cannot be adapted uh, for template attacks. It's it's unclear. It's unclear to me why. Um, so this is because template attack. What you do is you assume that you know the point in advance, and for example, you do you want to attack n bit of the key. You will do n templates for this point, and you get probability. But what you need to do for the belief propagation algorithm is to so do a graph of all internal operation, get the probability for each operation, or what value it is, and going back to the point. Since for a template you have already profiled everything for a single point, this is not. A, well, and I don't know if it's clear enough yet, but uh, okay. does it answer the question, or uh, am I not clear enough? Okay, I, th I think uh, I see it. We can better. talk about Thank it offline, though. Was there questions? No, so let's thank the speaker again. The next presentation is single trace side channel attacks on masked lattice based encryption. This is a joint work by Robert Primas, Peter Pessel, and Stefan Mangart, and the speaker is Robert Primas. Thanks for the introduction. 
Um, as the name of the talk already suggests, um, I will present now a single trace such an attack on mask graphics based encryption. And uh, let's have a quick uh, look at the outline of this talk. So um, what we are going to do is, uh, first of all, is just perform a kind of ordinary single trace um, uh, template attack on this uh, on a couple of, of, of operations in the lattice-based encryption scheme. And the more inter interesting part then would be the, to combine this uh, uh, obtained uh, leakage information with two algorithms. So we will use uh, the belief propagation algorithm as well as a uh, lattice decoding algorithm. And in the end, what this will allow us to do is to perform a full private key recovery of uh, this encryption scheme. So let's start with a little bit of motivation first. So why do we even want to consider uh, lattice-based encryption? Um, the, the, the reason is simple. Um, basically, uh, lattice-based cryptography um, is a promising candidate for post-quantum crypto. So, um, which basically means that uh, these encryption, uh, encryption schemes are um, believed to be resistant against quantum computers, which is a really, a really nice uh, property for uh, probably long-term security of uh, encryption schemes. And we already have quite a few efficient uh, cryptographic schemes based on those lattices. However, so far, there is not a lot of uh, implementation security uh, analysis for lots of those schemes, uh, especially in the single trace setting, which is why we want to provide the first step uh, towards this uh, direction of uh, uh, analysis. So let's start with the encryption scheme. Um, the encryption scheme that we're using was proposed by Lubachevsky, Pykert, and Regev. And it's based, as the name already suggests, on a running with errors problem. And additionally, it operates on polynomials in a certain polynomial ring, uh, which is uh, shown here. And in our setting, this uh, polynomial ring is parameterized by two coefficients. There is Q, Q a modulus, and the lattice dimension n. So how does it work? Basically, um, as always with asymmetric crypto, we start, uh, we need a private key, a public key, and a message. And all of those parameters are basically already polynomials at the beginning. So if Bob wants to encrypt a message and send it to Alice, then basically what he needs to do at first, he needs to uh, sample a couple of error polynomials from some error distribution uh, as seen here. And this one is usually, at least for lattice-based encryption, a Gaussian uh, error distribution. And then he simply combines uh, the public key with the message and those error terms and creates ciphertext that consists of two parts, C1 and C2. Now, the actual encryption is not that important. The most important takeaway from this slide is just that the ciphertext consists of two parts, and this is probably all we need for, for now. Um, the more interesting part, of course, is the decryption, since this is where we want to use the, the private key, which we want to recover in our attack. And fortunately, uh, the decryption is quite simple. It's just a very simple combination of the ciphertext with the private key. And all the operations here are very simple as well. So we see a polynomial multiplication and a polynomial addition. Now, one problem with uh, the, this decryption so far is that it's quite inefficient because as indicated down here, we need to perform those operations in a certain polynomial ring, which means that at some point we need to perform a reduction. And if you use some standard uh, algorithms, uh, so the, the, the standard solution, for example, would be a polynomial division, then this gets quite inefficient because runtime of polynomial division is not very fast. So what can we do about that? Well, there's the so-called number theoretic transform operation, which is basically an FFT that allows us to perform efficient polynomial multiplication, but uh, in our case, now in a polynomial ring, and actually it's the ring that we want that is uh, required actually, uh, by this encryption scheme, which is quite nice. So the usage is also really uh, uh, similar to an FFT, so given, for example, two polynomials, we can just perform the forward transformation, 
followed by a coefficient-wise multiplication of the two uh, polynomials and then perform the backward uh, transformation. And we have the, the multiplication of those two polynomials and we get the reduction uh, more or less for free. And by doing so, we can reduce the runtime to n log n, which uh, results in a quite a performance improvement. Now, if you know about uh, the implementation of an FFT, you probably recall that uh, usually a butterfly network is used here. And the same applies here. So also we can use a butterfly network for implementing an, ent an entity. And since uh, this butterfly network is a very important part of our attack, I will just now show you a simple visual uh, interpretation of uh, this uh, butterfly network. So an um, entity implementation for a two curve uh, uh, two coefficient polynomial would look roughly like this. Um, at the input, we have the two coefficients of our polynomial. And then all we need to do is basically a modular multiplication with some known twiddle factor, followed by a modular addition and a modular subtraction. That's basically it. We, uh, the transformed polynomial is then on the right side. Now, in our encryption scheme, we want to do this. But for larger polynomials, so we need to extend this butterfly uh, such that we can transform uh, larger polynomials. And the way to do this is uh, simply by following some recursive rule. So we extend the butterfly to the right and to the bottom, and, but the rest is the same. We still have the modular multiplications, additions, and subtractions. Um, in our case, we consider polynomials of size 256. So we just even further uh, extend the butterfly and that will end up with the implementation of the entity that is required for the encryption. So really what Alice should do instead of just uh, performing a polynomial division is uh, performing uh, coefficient-wise uh, multiplication of the ciphertext 1 with the private key R2 uh, followed by an addition and then the inverse transformation using the, enti the inverse entity and by doing so, she can do the encryption quite fast. OK, so now if you look at the formula for the decryption, that we can actually see that the, what we do here, that the input of this inverse entity transformation is just a very simple combination of the ciphertext and the private key. So what we can do now is we can rewrite this equation a really simple transformation and we can express the private key as a combination of the ciphertext and the input of this inverse entity transformation. Um, so this leads to the following attack strategy. So what we can do in first is we perform a single trace such a uh, template attack on this inverse entity transformation and we collect some leakage information from this uh, transformation. Then we want to use a belief propagation algorithm um, to combine multiple leakage points and uh, corresponding leakage information so that we can, um, in the end, uh, detect or recover the input of this inverse entity transformation and by that uh, recover the private key. So let's talk a little bit about the steps. In step one, as I already mentioned, it's more or less an ordinary template attack. So. Um, we use an efficient software implementation of this encryption scheme by the clerk at R. And for, as for the attack setup, we are using a Texas Instruments MSP 432 that features um, Cortex M4. And as for the uh, leakage uh, analysis, we do uh, EM uh, section attack. So basically, we place EM probes on the power regulation circuitry, as indicated here, for example. So what we are measuring is probably some, uh, something that is really close to the actual power consumption, but, but just we are uh, the EM section. OK, so what do we actually attack in step one? Uh, so as you know, we just have a modular multiplication, addition, and subtraction here in this butterfly. And we attack mainly the modular multiplication here. So. One thing about this multiplication is that we, all, we already know one of the factors here. It's this twiddle factor, and this is predefined by the encryption scheme, more or less. So what we then do is we want to recover the second um, factor of this uh, multiplication. Um, in this case, this x0, 1. And we additionally also exploit some timing information 
um, because uh, this modular multiplication, uh, while it is at least the multiplication is constant time, the reduction afterwards is not, at least in the implementation that we are analyzing here. So we can uh, do some uh, rough, uh, um, we, we can narrow down more or less the, the, the possibilities for this operand by just having a look at the runtime of this modular multiplication here. So in the end, what we want to achieve here is just to get an approximate uh, probability distribution for, for example, one of those coefficients here. And since we're doing just a single trace uh, template matching, it's of course quite noisy. This is one of what we expect. Um, now, as already mentioned, uh, in the text scheme, we need a larger butterfly network. So for example, if we consider um, this uh, entity for uh, four coefficient polynomials, then we have a setting like shown here. And basically here, we again, we attack this modular multiplications and we get some approximate prob probability distributions for the coefficients that are indicated in red here. So now let's go to step two. In step two, we show how we uh, can apply a belief propagation algorithm in order to improve the sectional leakage or the, the, the information that we gain from the uh, leakage points. So let's for now consider the following setting. Again, we have this two coefficient entity and let's uh, assume that we have some approximate knowledge about all those uh, the, um, coefficients that are used in this um, entity. Now, what we could do now is um, since this value here above, for example, is clearly just the result of those two values in the, in the input because it's just the, the addition. Um, it should be intuitively be possible to infer some information about this value given the, the probability distribution of those two values here. And this is exactly what the, the belief propagation algorithm attempts to do in our scenario. So in an optimistic case, it would look like this. So for example, it, it's possible that given the, the probabilities at the input, we can narrow down the possibilities for this for the, the coefficient at the output, so just one possible uh, value remains here. And we can do the same for the subtraction and recover the value down here, and we can also go backwards and then basically recover the input, which is what we want to do since if we know the input, then, recover, then we can recover the private key. Um, yeah, so in general, uh, this belief propagation algorithm is an iterative algorithm, so usually we do not expect it to work already just after one iteration. And usually it's also um, used uh, to calculate marginal distributions. Um, but in our case, we want to use it for combining leakage information. And first usage uh, is actually proposed by Vera uh, yeah, in this paper that we have, have the references at the end. So now, before we apply this belief propagation algorithm to our full uh, NTT or the corresponding butterfly network, we want to do two considerations. Uh, first of all, um, one implementation, implementation specific consequence of this uh, NTT is that we have an, quite an uneven distribution of sectional information in this butterfly network because these modular multiplications are not evenly distributed in this butterfly network. So as you can see here in this graph, it's more or less a simplified version uh, of this of a butterfly network for 256 input coefficients. And what is indicated in white here is the presence of a modular multiplication, while in the black parts we do not have any modular multiplication and hence no leakage information. And additionally, what we also observed during our attack is that in the first layer, the template um, matching performance is quite bad because this uh, twiddle factor that we are using in this modular multiplication, so the known factor is always one, so we do a, a modular multiplication with the value one. There's also no reduction. So there's not a lot of uh, variance in the power traces. So the, the template matching is quite uh, inefficient here, which is also why that the probabilities are very noisy in the first layer especially. So how can we overcome this problem? Um, we can split up our full butterfly network into three subnetworks, as shown here. For example, and by doing so, we can basically um, improve the ratio between observed coefficients and unobserved coefficients. So 
the SEC, for example, in that blue part, who have a lot of uh, previously white areas, where we, for example, completely ignore the black area above here. And this is good in a sense because these areas would cause a lot of uncertainty in the belief propagation algorithm uh, when it's applied to the full butterfly network. So, yeah. What we will show you now is uh, how this belief propagation algorithm performs when it's applied, for example, to the butterfly network down here. So, in iteration zero, basically what we do is we initialize all the coefficients uh, with uh, uniform distribution because we do not know anything yet about them. And after the first iteration, what we basically do is we introduce the sectional uh, information that we've obtained from the template matching. So these are now the probability distributions for all the recovered coefficients. But obviously, since we do a single trace matching, they are quite noisy, which is also why the entropy is quite, quite high. It's on average uh, 7 or 8 bit. So uh, what is more interesting is we now do a couple more iterations of this belief progression algorithm that we can see that the information is actually getting clearer. And basically what is happening here is we let all those coefficients talk to each other and come up with more likely distributions given the observations of the surrounding coefficients in this butterfly network. So let's just go to, for example, iteration 20. And what we see is that, at least in the later part of uh, in, the, in the layers eight or no, uh, eight or seven or eight, we have quite a good improvement of the leakage in, uh, information, which basically uh, it's indicated also by the fact that the entropy here is zero. So basically, the belief progression algorithm found that distinct values for all of those coefficients here at the back. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, we actually want to know the input of this inverse entity, which is a bummer because, especially in the input, we have still quite a lot of noise, and it's not getting better if we do more iterations of the belief propagation algorithm. Um, so what do we do? Um, um, what, what we can do is we can exploit the linearity of this inverse entity, for example. Now, what this basically means is that uh, as soon as we have recovered one of the columns here in this butterfly network, we can just calculate backwards and also we immediately know the input. So it's not an issue that we do not have the input immediately after the belief propagation. We ch can just uh, backwards calculate given one of the columns here at the back and then we have the input. Now, if you remember, um, previously I said that we split up this butterfly network into three subnetworks. And by doing so, we actually um, lose the, the, the possibility to recover the cover of, cover of, of coefficients over here. So there's no way, even if we perform this belief propagation for those three subnetworks that we've recovered inputs over here. So what do we do about that? Well, so far we could say that we know about 192 of the coefficients here, but what do, what do we do about the remaining ones? Well. Brute forcing is, is definitely not possible because the, the domain of, those, of all of those coefficients is quite high. So clearly we need to do something better. And we do this in uh, step three. Uh, it's just really quick. Um, what we can do is um, we can use all those uh, recovered coefficients and kind of relate them to the private key by setting up a system of equations. Uh, the details of these steps are um, explained in the paper. Uh, we can then combine this equation system with the public key and set up basically a shortest vectors problem that um, operates on a reduced rank lattice. And now, since the, 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 the rank of the lattice is reduced by quite a bit, actually it's reduced by, all the, by the number of coefficients that we were able to recover in the belief propagation step, we can now uh, solve this uh, shortest vectors problem by using some standard algorithm. In our case, we, for example, used the Decker set basis reduction algorithm. And by doing so, we observed that the uh, success rate of the lattice decoding in this scenario is always 1. So given 192 correctly uh, recovered coefficients in the belief propagation step, also the success rate of the decoding is 1. And we can basically um, recover the whole private key then. So 
I mentioned at the beginning that we're also attacking a mask implementation. So what about it? Um, we evaluated a, a scheme by Reparas, and the idea is quite simple. So if you remember at the beginning, I said that the decryption is quite simple. So it's just a simple combination of the private key with the cipher text. And here it's basically the same, except we split the private key into two shells. And we then um, operate, or we then perform two of these inverse entity transformations. And then we end up at the end with two shells of the message. Now, if we are able to recover 192 coefficients in each of those um, inverse entity transformations, then since all the uh, um, operations in the forward part of this uh, masking scheme are linear, we can just add those recovered coefficients, and then we can pretend that we're in the unmasked scenario and continue with step three as shown before. And we're done, basically. Um, so let me quickly uh, state the results of this uh, attack. So in step one, we just uh, performed a single trace template matching so that we obtain some approximate leakage for uh, all of those modular modifications that are performed in the inverse uh, NDT. In step two, we use the belief progression algorithm to combine the leakage of all of those multiplications and to recover most of the coefficients in, the, uh, in layer six, seven, and eight of this uh, uh, butterfly network. And as already, as already said, we can exploit the linearity to recover all the inputs done. In step three, we then show how we can brute force more or less the rest of the uh, coefficients that we could not recover by using the belief progression in an efficient way. So since the recovery of the 192 coefficients uh, in step two has a probability of one and the decoding step then also has a one, uh, then we can basically conclude that also the attack, at least in our scenario, also has a success rate of one. And as shown, um, this also holds for mask implementations. Now, in the paper, we also state some results uh, for a simulated leakage model, but uh, I have not decided not to state it here because for, for time and constraint reasons. So thanks for your attention, and if you have questions, please ask. Thank you, speaker. Any questions? Hello. Uh, sorry, I was just wondering, how do you protect against your attack? Well, there are a couple of things, of, uh, things that you could do. So, as already mentioned, uh, in the template matching, or in the, in the first step of the attack, we are also exploiting timing information of this modular multiplication. So, immediately what you could do is, for example, you could implement those in constant time. And by doing so, you can increase the, the entropy of the, of, the, of the leakage information by, let, I would say, one bit or two bits. And then it might already not work, but this has to be investigated, actually, in detail, if you want to have some... Um, Google answers there. But a more efficient uh, countermeasure would definitely be uh, just shuffling, for example. So if we go back to the, uh, to the butterfly, where do I have it? Um, for example, here we can see that uh, we can calculate all those butterflies. We do not need to calculate them in any order. It doesn't really matter. So if the, if the order of these butterflies is randomized, for example, then we can perform still a template attack, but we do not know where to put this leakage information then in, in, the, in the belief propagation step, and this would definitely cause this attack to fail then. So shuffling is definitely a very effective uh, countermeasure, for example. Yes, thank you. Another question here? Thank you for the talk. Um, did you did you investigate whether there are connections between uh, the way or you are uh, recovering the weights and the coefficients and uh, the um, the way our uh, algorithms are trained in uh, machine learning? Um, 
I'm pretty sure that there are connections, but we, we didn't really investigate there any further, so can I really give an answer to that now? Yeah. Maybe there are, it seems that there are at least some some similarities. Maybe maybe there are some ideas to 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 take in the in this field to to see improve. Yeah, of course. Uh, we also have some other ideas how we could improve those uh, the attack, but we're not really sure if they're going to work. <laughs> That's more. Yeah. Just but yes, of course. Uh, Thank you. Those are questions. No, so thanks for speaking again. The next talk is uh, sliding right into disaster, left to right sliding windows leak. Authors are Dan Bernstein, Joachim Breitner, Daniel Jenkin, Leon Grundbrunderink, Nadia Edinger, Tanya Lange, Christine van Vrendendo and Yuval Yarom. And the speaker is Leon Groot Blinder Ring. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I hope to surprise you uh, with this presentation uh, because we got some results when we were uh, carefully looking at the sliding window method, which is used uh, in RSA. Uh, so this talk is about a side channel attack on RSA and usually uh, these uh, attacks target the modular uh, exponentiation step in RSA and uh, one of the ways of implementing modular exponentiation is using sliding windows. Now we know for quite, quite some time that uh, constant time implementations cannot use sliding windows. Um, however, they are still used because the common belief is that uh, sliding windows do not leak enough uh, information to do a full key recovery. So um, in this work we did a couple of things. First of all we show that um, the so-called right to left sliding window, <coughs> window method uh, does not leak enough information. But wait, there's more. We also show that uh, the left to right sliding window method does leak enough. Um, we found two methods to extract information from the square and multiply sequence. And uh, these uh, methods uh, gave enough information to do a full key recovery. And we demonstrated uh, the real world applicability of this attack by, <coughs> by doing a full attack on libgcrypt, which is a, a library used in, for example, uh, GNU PG. Um, we also analyzed the reasons why left to right leaks more than right to left. So also we analyzed it in, in a theoretic sense. I assume everybody is familiar with RSA, but uh, just to, keep ev to uh, get everybody on the same page, I will uh, s uh, quickly go over the details. So in RSA, the key generation um, consists of uh, the following. Uh, you have a public key, uh, E, which is uh, an exponent, and uh, an N, which is the modulus. And this is um, the product of two big primes, P and Q. Uh, the secret key consists of three values, D, P, and Q. Uh, where uh, D is um, such that uh, E times D equals 1 mod uh, P minus 1 times Q minus 1. Um, to sign a message, you need a padded secure hash function. And um, if we assume we have such a thing, uh, then we can sign a message M by um, inserting it in the hash function and uh, raising that value to the power D mod N. And this is our signature, this is uh, value S. And uh, for the verification, uh, we simply take this value S, raise it to the power E mod N, and we verify whether uh, the outcome equals uh, the outcome of the uh, hash function uh, with M inserted. Uh, so this is all very simple. Uh, a common way of optimizing um, this, uh, this, this signature algorithm is using the so-called Chinese remainder theorem because um, this modular exponentiation is uh, quite costly. So what you do is you compute um, SP and SQ, where uh, SP is um, H of M to the power DP, uh, DP is um, D mod P, and DQ is D mod Q, and you uh, combine SP and SQ to S using a chi uh, Chinese remainder theorem. It's not really important for, uh, for the 
for the attack, but uh, I just want to mention that we attacked the, the Chinese remainder, um, the CRT version of RSA. Um, <clears throat> so how do we uh, implement the modular exponentiation using sliding windows? Uh, first of all, we take a, a certain window size W. For example, you can think of W being four or five. And we assume we have some sliding window form of D, which is simply uh, some values D n minus one to D zero, um, such that D is the sum of, of, yeah, you can see it here, the sum of uh, D i times two to the power i. And all these D i's, they are uh, odd numbers between zero and two to the power uh, w minus one. Now in general, if we want to compute uh, b to the d mod p, and p can also just be uh, the modulus n, we, uh, we perform the following operations. We first pre-compute small old powers of b, for example, b mod p, uh, b cubed mod p, all the way up to uh, b to the power uh, two, b to the power two to the power w minus one. Um, and note, uh, that the odd is both fat and underlined, so it's important one. And for each index, um, and we go to the uh, most significant index, n minus one to zero. Um, we, in each, uh, for each index, we square a, and for uh, non-zero values of d, we also multiply it. This is so. These is, uh, these are square and multiply operations, and we multiply uh, a by b to the power di mod p. And in the end, uh, you return A. So um, note that we have a branch whenever DI uh, is not equal to zero. So this leads to so-called square and multiply sequence. It's not constant time. Uh, one of the first side channel attacks on RSA was uh, when the sliding window form was simply the, the binary form of D. Um, but if you take sufficiently, sufficiently large W and you take the largest values, uh, the largest possible values for the DI, then there are too many options to try uh, to do a full key recovery. So this is the, like, the, um, like the common knowledge that, okay, it does leak some information, but it's not enough. So how do we actually compute the sliding window form? I left it open in the previous slide. Um, but there are two ways where, um, there are two ways uh, which are commonly used uh, to compute a sliding window form. Uh, for, I'm just going to go over an example, then you will easily get, uh, get the idea. Uh, so in this example, I will take W is 4 and D is 9059. And you see the binary expansion um, to the right of it. So in right to left method, uh, whenever you see uh, a non-zero uh, bit, you just uh, look at the full window and you uh, insert uh, the, the, in, the, the number in that full window um, uh, at, at the rightmost position of the, um, of the set of the, in, of the index where, with a non-zero uh, um, with a non-zero number. So here you see three. So you insert a three at the rightmost position, and the re remaining values will become zero. If you, whenever you see a zero, you just insert a zero and you, uh, you move on. So here you see eleven. Uh, one and one. So um, if you look at the windowed form, like the, the sliding window form, you see um, that there are a couple of non-zero uh, digits. So, and um, you do know the position, so you know at those positions there was, a, there was a one. But you don't know the value because it does this multiplication once. Now on average this will leak a, a fraction of two over w plus one. You will get one bit for each uh, window of size w, and you will get approximately one uh, zero bit between the windows. As you also saw, um, if you see uh, a gap between windows, you will also know that those are zeros. So on average, you will get uh, 2 over w plus 1 bits known. Now, when we go to the left to the, uh, <coughs> in the left to the right, you go to, from the um, most significant bit to the least significant bit. But uh, as I mentioned in a previous slide, you can only uh, take odd powers, uh, or, I mean, uh, odd values for, dub, for, um, for the uh, DIs. So uh, here you see, for example, the number eight in the window. However, um, we need 
uh, odd numbers. So you, what you do is you, uh, you go back uh, until you see a one, because then you, you get an odd number. Now here there are, there are no uh, ones anymore in this window, so you just have a window of size one, and you insert the one at that position. Um, now, uh, like the right to left method, whenever you see a zero, you just uh, go further and you insert a zero, zero, zero. Uh, here you have a full window size of uh, 13, and you insert it also at the rightmost uh, index. Um, here you see a one again, so you again have to um, go back until you see a one. Again, you have only a, uh, a window size of one, and you see zeros again. Um, and then the last window, you have a window size of three. So um, I hope everybody knows that when you now look at the windowed form, it looks um, a lot more different than the, the, the right to left windowed form. You even see, uh, you see a large gap between the, the first two windows and then no gap at all between the, the second and the third window. Um, but this, this method is actually um, preferred over the right to left method because it enables an on the fly encoding and exponentiation. As I said in a previous slide, for each non zero uh, di, you have to uh, do a multiplication and you can do this, these both at the same time. Um, but it's not really obvious how many, how many bits are leaking. So I will go over the analysis when, uh, from um, sliding right versus uh, sliding left. And I will show, and I hope to convince you that sliding left leaks, a uh, sliding right leaks a lot more than sliding left. So just some first observations. In the right to left method, whenever you see uh, a non-zero, you are guaranteed that there are W minus one zero bit bits after this non-zero. Uh, however, in the left to right, as you saw in the previous slide, two non-zero bits can be as close as adjacent. They can also be uh, a bit further away from each other, but um, this, this difference, this, this non-guaranteed uh, W minus one zero bits is, um, is what makes up for this, this difference. So you get a whole different pattern of, of, uh, of non-zeros. And this allows to uh, recover way more bits uh, when you look at the square multiply sequence. Um, as I said, uh, we, have two met we found two methods of uh, getting a lot more information of the square multiply sequence. Um, the first method is a bit more intuitive, so I will go over that one in a bit more detail. Um, basically, what you do is you look carefully at uh, the square and multiply sequence, and you deduce more uh, known bits from, uh, from four bit recovery rules that we found. The second method uses knowledge also not directly translatable to known bits. Uh, it's a bit more, it, it works better, but um, uh, the first method also gives the intuition why, why this works. So I will take these, the same example and just go over uh, the bit recovery rules. Um, so uh, here you see D is 9059 again, and when you look at square and multiply sequence, you see a bunch of uh, square and multiplies. And um, the first thing you do, we want to have uh, bits, so we convert every square and multiply to an underlined x because we know there was a multiplication there and every square just to an x. So you get this, uh, this um, sequence of x's and underlined x's. Now the first rule is really simple. Um, whenever we see an underlined x, we convert it to a one because we know there was an odd number at that position. So then you get sequence D2. Now rule one is um, one of the uh, uh, examples I also gave in the, in the, in the uh, it's one of the examples I also gave in the previous slide is whenever you have to backtrack. So you, uh, we have to have odd numbers. So when we don't see an odd number, we have to go back. So here uh, I made these uh, bits that we get from these, um, from this rule blue. So here you see we win three bits of uh, blue. Um, rule two is a bit more difficult to see, but when you think about it, if you see two multiplications right after each other, you know that the leading bit of the, f of the first window that you saw has to be a one. Why? <coughs> Why? If that bit wasn't a one, you would only see one multiplication. 
right? So if this um, red one was a zero, you wouldn't see um, two multiplications. So this also gives a few more known bits. And third, um, leading zeros basically means if you have a large gap between uh, two multiplications, you know that there were zeros in between. Now, uh, rule zero and rule three both uh, apply also to the right to left method, but um, the left to right method also has uh, rule one and rule three, uh, rule two, which makes up for a big difference. So when we look at the results, we performed some uh, experiments, just computing a, a bunch of random bit strings and applying the, um, uh, the left to right method. Then um, when you look at the uh, recovered bits per rule, you see that rule zero and rule three, um, they, have, they recover the most bits. However, rule one also uh, applies a lot and rule, uh, uh, rule two as well. And this is for, um, this is conform the libgcrypts implementation where we took uh, a, a bit string of 512 bits and w is four. Now, when you have a lot of uh, known bits, you can apply the Henning and Schacham al algorithm. Basically what you do is um, out of all these known bits, you compute a lot of, uh, you compute the uh, candidate solutions and these, um, you branch and prune these uh, candidate solutions uh, giving partial information, um, um, using RSA uh, equations and, and all the partial information you get on the RSA keys. So, um, but um, for an efficient attack, you need at least 50% known bits. So um, when we uh, looked at the recovered bits from the bit recovery rules, we saw that we recovered more than 50% of the bits in 32% uh, of the time, which means we can uh, break uh, RSA 1024 um, in uh, yeah, at least 32% uh, of the time. When we uh, looked at uh, RSA 2048, uh, W is five is used, which means uh, you get a bit less information. And we actually saw that the bit recovery rules did not give enough known bits to do a full uh, key recovery using Henning Shacham because uh, we didn't go over the 50% uh, bound at all. So um, we looked a bit, carefully, a bit more careful at the Henning Shacham algorithm and we developed the second uh, method. Um, basically what you do is the following. So in, in method one, we, we get the square and multiply sequence, we apply the bit recovery rules, and then we use uh, Henning and Shacham. We are not using the square and multiply sequence anymore. It's just uh, we insert it in the algorithm and hope it uh, pops out the key. Now, um, another way of doing it is um, as I said, the Henning and Shacham algorithm uses um, the RSA equations to branch uh, all these uh, candidate solutions. But instead, what you can do is um, you, take, um, you take all the known bits that you have and you compute the candidate solutions. And then from these candidate solutions, you, apply, you compute the, the square and multiply sequence. So um, whenever you have a candidate solution, you can uh, compute the square and multiply sequence, and you compare it to the ground truth that you got from the uh, side channel attack. And this method basically reuses the square and multiply sequence at each step in the, the Hanning and Shacham algorithm. And this, this, was, um, this turned out to be way more efficient than uh, using the, the known bits. And it also, um, so first if we look at the, uh, the results for RSA 1024, uh, you see that the right to left method leaks about uh, 40%, which is not enough for the Henning and Shacham algorithm. Uh, when we use the known bits uh, method, so method one, uh, you see that we already passed uh, the 50% line. But when we use the, um, the second method, which when you want to uh, quantify the, um, um, the amount of information you get, we use a so-called self-information measure. measure. Um, you see that we, we get past the 50% line um, easily. Um, and this even allows to, uh, uh, to recover RSA 2048 bit keys in 30% of the time. 
So this is, uh, this is quite nice. We, we could also uh, break RSA 2048 with this, with this method. <coughs> so we dem also demonstrated the, the, this vulnerability in libgcrypt. And this is, uh, this is fixed after uh, talking to the, alt, uh, to the developer uh, in version 1.7.8. Uh, we demonstrated it by uh, doing a full flush and reload cache attack using the Mastique toolkit. Um, there were some obstacles to overcome. For example, uh, libgcrypt always multiplies, so the square is also uh, a, a multiplication. And um, so, but, but we managed to find out which were actually multiplication and which were really squarings. Um, there's a lot more details in the paper. Um, but there's a lot more in the paper. We also, like I said uh, in the introduction, we also did a theoretical analysis of uh, the bit recovery rule um, using the so-called renew renewal reward processes, which are basically stochastic processes. Um, we also did a theoretical analysis of the direct pruning, like method two, using uh, self-information and collision entropy. And there's, there are also a lot more experimental results and details in the paper. And you can find the full version uh, online at, on ePrint. Uh, this was my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? We did some similar work at CRI and, and uh, found that we could see also sometimes the point at which um, the software saw the one that decided where to set the initial window. Um, were you able to leverage other sort of features of the, uh, of the algorithm that might leak in the cache um, to do the attack or uh, just the, the sort of um, point at which it did the square and multiply? Uh, yeah, we, we only looked at the square multiply sequence. So only, okay, we know the uh, locations of the multiply. Uh, what, what does it give us? And that, that's what we did. Thanks. Other questions? Hello, sorry, I, I apologize uh, if this was mentioned, but maybe I didn't understand. Uh, is it possible to apply the pruning approach you mentioned, where you were able to extract more information for the right to left method, also to the left to right, and to the, uh, to the other one that was not leaking that much? And did you try to apply that manual pruning to the other one to bring it over the 50%? Or um, it's just not possible? No, we, we, didn't, we didn't try that, but... Um, I'm not sure if that will work. It, it's still pretty far away from the 50% bound, and I'm not sure if this direct pruning will make up for that difference. Because if you put the plot, uh, you had the figure with the three, uh, the distance doesn't seem that big. Like, for example, you went with the orange one. After applying your method, you went way over the 55%, and the other one was approaching the 45%. So it seems like you are almost at the limit with that one. Um, yeah, we didn't do it, but my Indeed, be a good idea. Okay, thanks. More questions? Now, so let's thank the speaker again. So let's continue with uh, session number 10. So it's on encoding techniques. The first talk is on uh, homomorphic encryption. The title of the talk is Faster Homomorphic Function Evaluation Using Non-Integral Base Encoding. This is a joint work with by Charolette Monte, Carl Bootland, Yopo Boss, Uter Kastrick, Ilya Ilya Shenko, and Frederick Verkotteran. Carl Bootland will give the talk. Yes, thank you for the introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. So in my presentation, I'll be telling you how to speed up uh, homomorphic function evaluation by giving a new encoding technique. So we applied this encoding technique to a real-world application. 
In our case, it was a uh, privacy preserving forecasting algorithm for uh, the electro uh, yeah, energy consumption on the, on the grid. And we were able to, uh, to give a, an implementation that was 13 times faster than previous work. So, to begin with, uh, the setting we're looking at is uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption. So, in somewhat homomorphic encryption, this, this is a cryptographic technique which allows some untrusted third party to perform some limited number of computational steps on encrypted data. So, what does this look like in practice? Well, suppose Alice has some sensitive data, she would like to perform some, uh, fun so compute some function on, on her data, but instead of doing this herself, she would like to outsource this to the cloud, for example. So what Alice can do is first encrypt her data and send it to the cloud, together with information about what function she wants to compute. Because the cloud doesn't have the secret key, it cannot learn any information about Alice's data, but what the cloud can do is perform some limited number of computational steps. So you should think of these computational steps as additions and multiplications. Once it's done this, it sends back to Alice an encrypted result, and Alice can decrypt and get the result she wanted. So in all practical SHE schemes, the plain text space looks like this. It's polynomials in X, where we reduce modulo a coefficient modulus t, which is some relatively small integer, and we also reduce uh, by a polynomial modulus x to the power 2 to the k plus 1. So in practice, what does this mean? Well, it's polynomials of degree at most, 2 to the k minus 1, where the coefficients are between 0 and t. Of course, our data is not of this form, so we have to encode our data into the plain text space. And the problem is, what is the best way of doing this? So in previous work, what is common to use is a base B encoding. Here for an integer B and a real value theta, then we can approximate theta by a polynomial in B. And we allowed here to use negative powers of the base B. Here the integers must be, the, the coefficients must be integers though. So here's an example, I'm sure everyone's familiar, decimal expansion. Here the base is uh, 10, and we allow the coefficients to be between 0 and 9, together with a sign. So as an example, I've shown uh, pi here, and the plot underneath gives you, just plots the coefficients uh, for each power of the base. So to read this plot, you read from right to left, and you see it's uh, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, and so on. And this plot can continue off the end of the screen, depending on how accurate you want your, your encoding to be. So another example is balanced ternary expansion. Here the base B equals 3, and we restrict the coefficients 0 and plus or minus 1. So for example, pi, the plot looks like this. And what's nice about this is that the coefficients are very small. Another example is the NAF expansion, or non-adjacent form. Here we use base B equals 2, and again, only allow coefficients 0 or plus or minus 1. But we restrict now to, to the fact that any two consecutive coefficients can have at most one that is non-zero. So this gives a bit of sparsity to our plot here. And this can be generalized to what's called WNAF, here now, in every W consecutive coefficients, there can be at most one that is non-zero. In our example, pi, we see that uh, the coefficients now have to be a lot larger. In fact, they can be up to 2 to the W minus 1. So in fact, this is, this is not good for our applications. So once we have such an expression, how do we actually get to an encoding of our data theta? Well, we simply replace uh, the base B by an indeterminate X, and then reduce modulo, the coefficient modulus and the polynomial modulus to become an element of the plain text space. So of course, we want our encoding uh, algorithm to be invertible so that we can decode. So this means that we can only allow a maximal possible range of values for our coefficients to be at most T, but a range of at most T. 
So, for example, you could say the coefficients uh, between minus t over 2 and t over 2. We also require that there can be at most 2 to the k coefficients. Um, and this must be for every encoding we produce. So we give integers u and l, u for upper bound, l for lower bound, uh, and say that we, the highest power of the base b, which we can use, is b to the u, and the smallest is b to the minus l. And then this gives the constraint that l plus u plus 1 has to equal 2 to the k. Now, as I said, decoding is just inverse of encoding. And if you want to, our decoding to be correct after we perform some computation, then we're, we're required to stay in this box. So this is when we compute without reducing by the coefficient modulus or the polynomial modulus. So essentially, we're saying if we did reduce by these uh, uh, pol the polynomial modulus or the coefficient modulus, then uh, we wouldn't actually be required to do this, because when we do, then we wrap around and we would get an error during decoding. And if we know in advance the sorts of computations we want to do, then this gives some conditions on t, l, u, and thus the power of 2 that we take. And more precisely, what do, what do t and 2 to the k depend on? Well, firstly, the complexity of the computations we want to perform. So the more computations we want to perform, the larger uh, the, the, larger the, um, the value of t and 2 to the k we need. Another condition is the, the size and precision of the data, as well as the encoding technique we use. So really what this means is the amount of information in your data. If we have more information, then we need more coefficients, and essentially we need larger parameters. Again, if we if we allow large coefficients in our expansions, then we need a larger value of t. So the, really the main thing uh, actually comes from the underlying SHE scheme which we use. In particular, the security requirements require that we have a, a very large um, degree, which is 2 to the k. So here, k is at least 11 to thwart lattice-based attacks. Uh, so this, this is really a large number of coefficients that we have. Um, also, from correctness, we, need, uh, uh, we have a bound on the maximum value of t we can use, but we can use the Chinese remainder theorem to get around this and split our uh, coefficient modulus t into various factors. So this isn't a big problem, but of course, we want our scheme to be practical, so we can't allow too many factors in this CRT decomposition. So, in previous work, they used balanced ternary or NAF expansions, but the problem with these expansions is they do not make full use of the plaintext space. So here, for example, the plaintext space is shown by the shaded box, and actually the encodings only fill the, the shaded ellipse here. And we see that we do not use the full width of the box here, which comes from the security requirements. What we'd much prefer is something that looks like this much flatter, and it uses the full width of the box. So the problem is, can we find such an encoding scheme which uses the plain text space more efficiently? So what we noticed was that for smaller bases B, we get longer encodings, uh, and that which have smaller coefficients. So to show you this, I have an example. Here I just picked a random number, 7140.1249 and use some simple greedy algorithm to encode it using a base B. So here is B equals to 10, and as I click through, the base B will decrease, and watch how the expansions get longer and the coefficients get smaller. So this is B equals 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and then we have to stop. There are no more integers larger than 1 we can use. And this is a problem because we would like even longer expansions. So what we realized was actually the data we're encoding is already a real value, so we don't really need the fact that the base b is an integer. A real number does just as well. So the idea is simply to use a non-integral base. So another 
There's a couple of things we would like. Firstly, the coefficients in our encoding should be as small as possible, so we only allow zero or plus or minus one. We would also like the expansions to be sparse, so we use the WNAF condition that in every W consecutive coefficients, and most one can be non-zero. Finally, we want a nice, simple, and efficient encoding algorithm, so we just use the, a greedy algorithm for this. And putting all of these things together, this led us to the idea of using a non-integral base, non-adjacent form encoding with window size W, or what we call WNIBNAF for short. So what is the base we use in WNIBNAF? Well, it is simply the unique positive real root of the following polynomial, which depends on W. So if we have a real value theta and the base be W now, and we want to encode this to within precision epsilon, what do we do? Well, first, if the magnitude of, of theta is already at most epsilon, then we could just return zero. Otherwise, we find the closest sign power to, of the base to theta. So if this is bw to the r and the sign is sigma, then we recursively find an encoding of the difference. And then if this is, say, a of x, then we simply return sigma times x to the power of r plus a of x as an encoding of theta. So what we really want to do, of course, is perform some computations on our encodings. Um, and for this, we require, well, when we perform such computations, the coefficients grow, and this uh, limits the, the coefficient modulus we can take. And so we need a good analysis of how these coefficients grow so that we can choose a, a good value for t, the coefficient modulus. So what other things actually affect the co coefficient growth? Well, firstly, the size of the coefficients in the original encodings, but this is already minimal for us. The length of the encodings also plays a role in multiplication. Um, so the longer the encoding, the more summons you sum over in the multiplication. And so this could give larger coefficients, which is why we need the third condition that the encodings are sparse as well. And this is what our parameter W does. So, as W changes, as W gets larger, then the expansions get longer, but they're also sparser. So here I plotted in red the number of zero coefficients, and this increases as W increases, which is what we expect as they're now sparser. What's more important is the blue line, which is the number of non-zero coefficients, and we see that this actually decreases as W increases, which is exactly what we wanted. So here, a quick slide on a theoretical worst case bound. If we define BW of N and P to be the maximum possible coefficient that appears after multiplying P encodings together, here N is the number of, um, of well, the, the maximum number of non-zero coefficients that could appear in any encoding, then we find that it, this bound is given by this lovely formula here. And Matner and Rose showed that uh, this can be bounded uh, by this uh, formula here. And this is uh, essentially as tight as possible because it is asymptotically uh, the, the limit. But what I'm going to say now is actually you can forget that last slide because in practice the theoretical worst case bound is very, very pessimistic and almost never occurs. So here I've plotted in pink the theoretical bound and in blue, the observed maximum over 10,000 samples. Here, each sample is uh, after multiplying five WNIBNAF encodings. And notice that the y-axis is logarithmic, so really this is a huge difference between the two. Also, uh, we need to look at how multiplication affects the coefficients. Here, I plotted the uh, um, for the case of W equals 2. And on the, on the x-axis, it tells you which coefficient we're looking at. And I plotted this for after one multiplication in the blue and all the way through to five multiplications in green. And as you can see, the more multiplications we do, the larger the coefficients get and the longer the expansions get, which is to be expected. And we get a very similar picture now for W equals 100. 
And what's more important is when I plot these two side by side. So here I've just taken one of the, the curves to simplify things. In blue uh, is the w equals 2, and in red, w equals 10. And we see that for larger w, it gives much flatter curves, which are also wider, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So in practice, we implemented this. Of course, now we have additions as well, but this doesn't really affect the curves that we see. And in the previous work, they used balanced ternary and NAF expansions. And these required uh, plain text modulus to be about 40 bits. Um, but with our, our new scheme, we used 950 NIBNAF, and we could get this right down to just over t five bits. In fact, we could take our plain text modulus T to be 33, and then we only have one factor in our Chinese a remain theorem decomposition, whereas before they had 13, and this is where we get our factor 13 speed up. And it also means that our ciphertexts are 13 times smaller. So what are the take-home messages from this presentation? Well, first we introduced a new encoding te technique called WNIBNAF. It uses real numbers, uh, it, sorry, it encodes real numbers for use with homomorphic encryption schemes. And it uses a small non-integral base to do this, which gives longer expansions. And this makes much better use of the plain text space. This allows us to use a much smaller value for the coefficient modulus t. And this, this gives much smaller ciphertexts and faster implementations. So that's my talk. Thanks for listening. Is there anyone with any questions? Thank you, Carl. Uh, any questions? Hey, just, just a quick one. Do you have a constant time implementation of your encoding? No, we, we just uh, implemented this in the software using a previous uh, implementation, so it's not con constant time, no. But we didn't consider this uh, sort of side channel attacks in our, our work, so. Hello, Carl. Thanks for the talk. Uh, the bounds you shown earlier for the N, you shown uh, the bounds, and then you showed that in practice uh, they are not very good because uh, yeah. there is a great difference. Uh, how useful are these bounds for you? And uh, how sure are you that the theoretical bound you found is actually the lowest bound you could get? And do you think you'd get, you could get a better improved bound, and would that help in your work somehow? So this theoretical bound is actually the best you can get. The, the problem is that uh, it's very, very unlikely. You have to be very unlucky to actually have some, um, some encodings which you multiply together and which give a coefficient that is uh, as large as possible. So I guess my question is first, how do you know that this is the best you can get? And why are you sure this cannot be improved? Because generic bounds can be improved. And the second is, how would this help you to get, let's say, a better bound if that would be possible? And if that would help in some sense? So, so what did you say, sorry, about... So the first one, why are you sure the bound cannot be improved? And the second, if it could be improved somehow, if that would help you in any, in any way? So, I mean, in our paper, we give a, a proof that this, this is really as tight as you can get. We give an example which, which gives this uh, bound. So really, we, we cannot go any smaller than this. Yeah. Um, any other questions? But yeah, this, this is a very artificial example. It's not going to uh, happen in practice. That's, that's the difference. I have a question. So you used non-integral uh, real uh, base, right? Yes. Like, can you extend these results to a complex base? Um, it's definitely possible, and people have proposed schemes which use complex base. Um, 
but here you have the problem of how, how do you uh, encode, uh, uh, if you want to encode complex numbers, um, how, how do you actually do this? Because now you have not only the magnitude, but also an angular component. And um, in other work, they, use, they have to use things like uh, LLL to find uh, uh, an encoding with small coefficients. So if you, if you want to en encode complex numbers, I think the best way would be just to, to split it, in it into its real part and imaginary part, and then do the two separately. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. So the next talk is on puffs. The title of the talk is Hiding Secrecy Leakage in Leaky Helper Data. This is a joint work by Matthias Hiller and uh, Ayasun Gurur Onalan. Matthias Hiller will give the talk. This one on? Yeah, better. OK. So hello, everyone, and yeah, welcome to my talk, um, Hiding Secrecy Leakage in Leaky Helper Data. Um, so let's start with a brief agenda over the, the topics I'll cover in this talk. I'll um, start with key generation with biased puffs. So what's the, the motivation behind of that, and what are the, the issues you, you see there? Um, then I'll give you a brief impression over state-of-the-art approaches and then go to wiretap coset coding, which we applied for, for puffs for the first time. Um, I'll walk you through with a, an example to, to show how it works, why it works, um, then go a little bit into trade-offs between different parameters and their effect on the leakage, and then end with some practical results. So first of all, there's a, a big promise for puffs, or a wish, um, you assume, or that puff responses are independent and uniform. That um, holds sometimes, sometimes not, um, because reality um, shows, OK, for several implementations, puffs are actually biased, um, so that they don't have an equal number of zeros and ones. So in the following, I'll assume an independent distribution so that all puff response bits follow the same distribution, but that they're biased. In, in a sense that some of them tend either to more towards zero or more towards one, depending on the distribution. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, and the, the issue with biased puff responses is that they cause leakage. So um, at last chest, there was a talk about that by Del Voida, um, looking at how, how bad is leakage actually. Um, so it's not as bad as the n minus k bound assumed. But still, leakage is a, is a big issue and has to be, be addressed. Um, yeah, and to, to address that, there were um, leakage, different leakage mitigation steps that were introduced over the, the last years. Um, yeah, mainly doing deep biasing, so trying to um, transform the, the biased distribution or biased sequence into something unbiased. So let's take a look at the system. Um, looking at the, the helper data generation, we have two paths. The, the upper path coming from the puff and a, a lower path on the, with the encoder. In the upper path, we have a, a puff with a biased puff response. And um, this puff response is then fed into a debiasing step where the, the bias distribution is turned into, into something uniform. And in the, the lower path, we have a, either a secret or a random number, and then it's fed into the encoder of an error correcting code to add redundancy and enable error correction later on. Then in the next step, we have the, the syndrome encoder that has the deep biased puff response and also the, the code word of the, the ECC as inputs, and we generate helper data with that. 
So to show you two approaches how bias puff responses can, or were handled so far, um, the first one is index-based syndrome coding by UN Devaders from 2010. Here the idea is you look at, look at puff responses with, and the puff response have different, different reliabilities, different probabilities of, of being either a zero or one. So for example, the, the white boxes are assumed to be puff responses that are close to zero. Um, the, the black ones are puff responses that are close to one. And if we, for example, want to encode a, a zero, we're looking at the puff response, okay, that is zero with the highest probability, and then store a pointer to that. That's one approach, um, kind of to, to use the independence here to generate something uniform. Um, but it comes at the, the expense that the puff sequence is reduced to a shorter, shorter sequence. Another way how to go is using a von Neumann corrector, which was discussed at chess two years ago, um, introduced by, by Mars et al. Um, here the, the idea is to look at um, blocks that occur with the same probability. So if, for example, pairs of zero and one or one and zero occur with the some, same probability regardless of the probability of a zero or a one. And so you, you look for these blocks and then check, okay, was the first bit there either a zero or a one? And with that, you're also able to, to generate a uniform sequence, but also at the expense that other path response bits are not, not treated. And yeah, so one way to go is not trying to de-bias the path response. Um, we, we chose to do coding instead and leave the, the path response the way it is and try to, to fix things on the, the coding side. Um, here for the, this example, we'll use a read malloc code. Um, it's basically a parity check code. So we have the um, three information bits and then check, okay, is odd parity true or not? So for example, if we just have a, a single one, it's, it's one. Another one, it's one. If we have two ones, it's zero again, and so on. So that's the, the way how the redundancy is computed here. Now, let's assume we observe some helper data. In this example, for example, we see, okay, helper data was three zeros and a one. Now what's the corresponding puff candidate for that? So for example here, if we had the, the all zeros code word, then the corresponding puff response is the three zeros and a one. Um, and then it, it just goes through. So for example, down, down here, you just always flip the last bit as the, the helper data tells us to come from the code word to the puff response. Now, as the puff responses are biased, they occur with different probability. And that's how, where things get interesting. So for example, um, the, if we have three zeros and a one, then, and we assume that ones only occur with 0.25 as probability, just as a generic example, then we have some puff response that occur with um, 0.75 to the three times 0.25, and others that occur with 0.75 times 0.25 to the three. So if we, we look at the probabilities here, actually the, the group separates into two parts. We have some of them, the, the upper three and the lower one here that occur with 0.225. And then in here we have a, a group of four that occur with 0.025. So something you can see here is that the puff response um, does not protect all key candidates in the same way or that the, the helper data leaks information and we can basically um, reduce the, the key space to, to half of it. In, in this case here, because it, it was really significant leakage. Um, yeah, and so we, we have some significant leakage in here. And to, to address that, we looked at wiretap coset coding. Now the, the idea is we split the secret here into a mask component and a secret component. So if we take the first bit, what's happening? Um, it's, it's turning off. <laughs> Is the power plugged in? Nope. Okay, boot screen, nice. Okay, there's a Windows frame loading. Um, or I have the, the presentation in sleep mode on another computer. Hmm. 
Yep, yep, we're almost back. Okay, what I was talking about is that we take the first bit of the, um, of the message now as a secret. Oh no, we have the, the three bits and we take the first bit as a mask and then interpret the other bits as a secret. So now the, the idea is that um, we don't have a three-bit secret anymore. Rather than having a first bit as a mask and then two, two more bits, and that will reduce the key space in the following, as the slide might, might show afterwards. So um, and now the, the idea is that we reduce the number of key candidates from eight to four. And don't have a one-to-one -one mapping that each um, puff candidate map is matched to some helper data candidate. Um, or no, we have one-to-one -one mappings between helper data and puff response. But now we create an ambiguous mapping between um, two of them and one secret. So instead of having a one-to-one one -one mapping between puff response, yeah, yeah, puff response and um, and secret, now we have a two-to-one mapping that two puff responses are mapped to one secret. Um, as we might, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, that was the, the last one where we had the, the probabilities in here. Um, and now we have the, the mapping here that we don't have a three-bit secret anymore, just instead have a one-bit mask and a two-bit secret. Now, and if we interpret that, then we have, for example, here, this candidate that is mapped to key zero, zero, and this candidate that is mapped to key zero, zero. So now, instead of having a one-to-one -one mapping that um, one helper data, uh, one puff candidate is mapped to one secret, now we have two puff candidates mapped to that secret. And the nice thing is, now these two occur with 0.25 together. So now we have a two-to-one mapping, and in this two-to-one mapping, um, actually they occur yeah, with, a, with a quarter. And now if we look at the next pair, if we have um, key candidate 01, and here also 01, they also occur with that. And if we continue and continue, um, the, the nice thing is now we actually have four key candidates that all occur with the same probability for the given helper data. And now we're back to uniform. That all, all four candidates occur with the same probability. And we, we did that by interpreting the, the first bit as a mask and only having the, the other bits as secret. And yeah, so in this case, it provides a, a perfect debiasing for helper data 001. Now, um, unfortunately, that would be too nice to be true if that would already hold in general. So, for example, if we look at a different helper data candidate, we just had half of the, the possible puff responses, now we have the other half. If we have this helper data candidate here, now we have uh, four ones, four zeros, and the others with two ones and two zeros. So now what we can see is that we don't have a, um, four candidates with one probability and four with the other probability mapping. Instead, we have one candidate here with a very low probability, one with a very high one, and six in between. So what you can, which um, also shows in the, up in the resulting probabilities, that we have one extremely probable candidate here, one very unlikely one here, and six other ones in between. Um, so if we apply the, the deep biasing again with one mask bit, uh, we can see, okay, it helps a little to smoothen things out to have one mask bit and two key bits. Um, if we take it one step further and have two mask bits and only one key bit left, then we still have a kind of three to one chance. So, um, yeah, that's why we have to go to larger codes and that's kind of a limitation of the four bit example. So later on I'll go to an eight bit example and then for the implement or the um, simulation results, I'll show you something even larger, so um, yeah, well, that's the, the basic principle. And um, so wiretap coset coding for puffs. Um, yeah, instead of having a deterministic mapping, now we have some randomized encoding in here that um, allows to have part of the, the information as mask and only the other part as a secret. And this allows to, um, to mask and well, the, the basic principle is the, the more mask bits we assign, the better is the debiasing. Unfortunately, de, um, depending on the, the code structure, we have a, or 
um, caused by the code structure. If we use the read Muller codes, as in this example, we have a decreasing marginal, marginal benefit um, in a sense that the, the first mask bits have the highest effect and then by applying more and more mask bits, the, the impact becomes less and, um, until we approach zero. So yeah, let's go to a bigger, bigger example. Um, we, we started with a four bit case, now we have an eight bit case, a code with eight, four, eight bit length, four information bits, four bit distance, and something you can see here. Um, first of all, if we have 0.5 as probability, we're unbiased and don't, don't have leakage. Now for example here, if we have 60% ones or zeros, um, we have a, a leakage of roughly point, uh, 1.2 of our four information bits. So we have some, some leakage in here, by, and by applying the first mask bit, we can already cut that by half. Um, so that in this case, then 0 0.5, 0 0.6 of the three remaining bits would still um, be leaked, and then it goes to zero. And as you can also see here, the, the marginal benefit decreases um, because the, the Hamming weight in the, the generator matrix decreases. Um, yeah, and kind of with a, a four-bit example, it's still, still quite limited, so going to something larger. Now the um, kind of Rather with less redundancy in here, we have seven information bits now uh, out of and one bit parity. And for example, here if we, we are in this case, we have we leak two out of the seven bits. If we don't have any mask, if we apply the first mask bit, we leak one out of six. And then for example, if we apply three or four mask bits, we, we get close to zero in the leakage. And with that, we're we're able to to achieve zero leakage. And um, yeah, for 0.6 bias, um, if we, we have a, a higher bias, we, we have to apply more mask bits. Um, and yeah, for the, the small cases here with 8-bit with um, code word length, we can do exact computations. If we go to larger code sizes, we have to um, go to bounding techniques. For example, the, the bound introduced here at last chess by, by Delvaux applies very well, and that's um, what we use to, to bind, bound larger results. So going to code lengths 32, 64, 128, um, in, in this domain, then you really have to, to bound. And yeah, let's go to the practical results. Um, here the, the scenario is that we have a, a puff with a bias of 0.54. We will want to derive a 128 bit key and have 15% error probability in average at the input and want to derive a, a key with an error probability smaller than 10 to minus 6. So, two approaches here how to, to address this um, with, with conventional methods without debiasing would be to, to use a fuzzy extractor construction. Um, if we have 1500 puff bits, we, we need roughly 200 secret bits. Um, because we have a leakage of 65, um, upper bounded, so it's slightly less in re reality. Um, using differential sequence coding, uh, a pointer-based approach, we, we run into the, the same issue that we also have 37 um, bits of leakage. And if we, we go to the debiasing schemes, something you can see here is that we really have a, a leakage of zero, but we also have to pay a price for that in a sense that the, the number of puff bits increases that is required. Um, yeah, so for example here we have like 200 more compared to, um, to the fuzzy extractor construction or even 1000 more compared to DSC and then the, the von Neumann construction is even um, more expensive in, in terms of puff bits. And to, to compare that with our coset coding approach, um, Coset coding works good with high rate codes with low redundancy. So with that we have a concatenated um, approach here that we first have differential sequence coding to reduce the input error probability and then do the debiasing with coset coding. Um, yeah, and due to the, the code parameters for Muller codes we have a, a secret of 138. Um, we have 30 mask bits that were applied and with that we can upper bound the leakage by 0.06. For, um, bits leakage on the entire key. So, um, kind of, we, yeah, we have to, to pay, pay a price of roughly 60, 65 puff bits to, to get rid of the leakage, but with that we can, can upper bound the, the leakage then. Um, 
Yeah, and if we, we wa um, want to be even more conservative and have a, a stricter upper bound going from 0.06 to 0.01 as upper bound for the leakage, so rea reality will be lower. Um, in this case, we have to spend a lot more effort on the debiasing and, and then have to double the puff size on that. And that would, would bring us back into the, the domain of the, the other solutions. Um, yeah, so to, to wrap it up, um, yeah, in the, this paper we introduced wiretap cosite coding to the domains of puffs, um, which allows to, to bring the helper data leakage down to zero, close to zero, um, and with that solves leakage problems on the coding side, not on the, on a, as a debiasing solution in between. Then, um, yeah, we have some efficient practical results. So for the, the reference scenario, we were able to, to bring down the, um, the number of puff bits from 1,700 to, to 700. And also another point is that, um, yeah, in this talk I kind of completely omitted the theoretical part and wanted to focus on the motivation, how to, to get there. And yeah, in, in the paper we, we explain how to, why, why can we use wiretap coset or wiretap codes in general in the, the domain of puffs? Where are the parallels to, to physical layer security? And then introduce wiretap coset coding for our problem. And then also present more, more practical results and also discuss the, the bounding more in detail. Okay, thanks a lot. That, that's it from, from my side. Are there any questions? Thank you, Matthias, and sorry for the interruption during the talk. So, no any questions? So, if there are no questions, then let's thank both the speakers again. Thanks. So now it's time for lunch and uh, please be back by 2.40 for the final session. Thank you.